Hey, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Beyond All Reason. Uh, sorry, to the Brightworks. Well, I guess it's Beyond All Reason, too. Uh, welcome, either way, to a top level game that was recently played on Baryon Tar Lake. Or maybe it's Baryon Tar Lake. Either way, going to be a pretty fun one. It's got this big old tar field that we can sweep across right here and see all the geothermal spots up on top of these mountains. There's these little lowland metal extractor areas, little hills risen above the creeping, ever rising tar pits. Uh, it doesn't actually rise, but that'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Anyways, the tar slows down vehicles and bots. It's one of the most interesting dynamic pathing issues for uh, beyond all reason as far as the bots and vehicles go. They're going to be making interesting decisions between fighting on the tar and fighting off the tar, whether or not that uh, difference will come to present itself. Well, I guess we'll just have to sit around and see. The blue commander goes by the name of Unicorn Cats here, spawning right up on the front line, and I always love to see that. Sometimes... It's nice to just spawn up on the front, show your team how it's done, and Unicorn Cat's definitely a very experienced player. Gonna be showing us what he's got. 38 true skill. Gonna be starting off with those Armada bots. I love to see it. Probably my favorite unit group in the entire game, the Armada bots. Cortex bots are wonderful, don't get me wrong, but Armada bots were all, will always be where my heart lies. Now, interestingly, in exactly the same location, uh, mirrored across the map right here, is the Red Commander. Oh, interesting. Looks like we had somebody leave. Ah, interesting. That could be some uh, some interesting gameplay. I know I just said that three times in a row. Maybe we can go for a fourth here. The interesting thing between uh, sharing a commander like this means that suddenly Pasta Polo has the control of two different economies. So I'm curious to see what we're going to go for here. We could either rush out T2 Tech at the sacrifice of our frontline lab over here, or we could go into maybe a, a sideways tech transition, go into some vehicles, maybe go into some airplanes, anything like that. A lot of options suddenly opening themselves up right here for the Red Commander. Curious to see exactly which we're going to choose. Already a tick running across the map slowly but surely. You can see down there in the bottom left hand corner, tanks move at 75% speed and bots move at 85% speed. Kind of interesting because it does mean, oh, that's five, isn't it? We need an interest encounter. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, a weird interaction because it means that suddenly vehicles and bots can sort of interact on an even playing field. They can they can kite each other, and by that I guess I mean that the bots can kite the vehicles, whereas usually the vehicles have the speed advantage out on the Great Tar Lakes. Not so much. Blitz will be used to shut down a couple of the grunts that were aggressing across the map right here from Achille. Not bad. Nice deflection right here from the Powder Blue Commander. Goes by the name of Locaccio. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Locascio. That sounds like a, a cool way of pronouncing that. Always love when I mispronounce names and then everyone corrects me in the comment section. That might sound like sarcasm, but I assure you it isn't. Unironically, one of my favorite things about doing these is that I get to learn all the different accents and the, the pronunciation styles. Oh, that was slick right there. Did you see that? That rover killed two of the pursuing rovers by blowing up that radar tower, detonating it, and then causing the other rovers to die in the explosion. That was a very slick little micro moment right there from Black Flames. Don't know if it was intentional or not, but either way, that ended up being really cool. Love little moments like that and beyond all reason. One of the things that make this game so special. I've been watching a lot of League of Legends videos, just shorts and whatnot, character breakdowns. I'm sure you've seen the, the like on the YouTube shorts page, but uh, I was watching some of those and I realized one of the things that I appreciate about Bar so much is that each one of these units is individually stylized to be sort of its own little thing on the battlefield, right? We have the little meatball here wandering around, accompanied by its rocketeer brother. They're styled to be present in the universe. Like, they look like they fit in on the battlefield fighting each other. They look like their own individual little thing. They don't have any weird warping or anything from perspective. One of the things that always bugged me about StarCraft is you're kind of locked into this sort of three-quarters perspective like this. Kind of have this sort of a perspective the whole time. Bar, we can really get up close and personal and really get to know these units. What is your think or your perspectives on this ordeal? Mr. Meatball. Centurion here. Wants nothing to do with this commander. Commander will, or should at the very least, launch a D-gun directly into the face of that Centurion. Very, very nicely done. Speaking of Centurions, interesting the Unicorns is Unicorn Unicorn Cats, pardon me, has gone into the Centurions here. Definitely an interesting choice. Centurion Rocketeer. Could be pretty interesting. I'm not sure if the Centurion Rocketeer, there's six by the way, or was that seven? I've lost track already. Uh, Centurion's very, very slow moving. Actually, one of the few units slower than the Rocketeer, if I remember correctly. I think the Maces outpace them. I think the, uh, Centurion might be one of the few that is actually slower than those Rocket Boys. A little bit of aggression over here, but it's nicely cleaned up. Powder Blue Commander holding the ground over here, putting down that LLT, which will drive back Adam School, the Tan Commander, contesting this lane. Shell Shockers up in the air. Uh, Wolverines firing away to contest that. Always a tricky battle between Shell Shockers and Wolverines. 
Very difficult to gauge how effective of a composition your enemy has when they're firing away from you just outside of line of sight or radar range. Ooh, with Unicorn Cat's taking a lot of damage in the middle of the map right here. We do have an air player, by the way. Air player for the blue team. Fractal Hex. I remember that name. And we do have a T2 transition. Interesting. Okay, so Pasta Bolo has decided to go for a bit of a greedier build here. Going for the T2 transition, using that double economy to get that T2 lab out a little bit quicker here. Not the quickest T2 lab we've certainly seen, especially that last video where we saw the teamwork T2 lab that was a very, very well, well organized T2 transition. It was, it was definitely a well planned build, a well oiled build. Uh, this is a little bit slower than that, but certainly looking quite good. And micromanaging all these Rocketeers in the front, obviously, while also handling that in the back line is quite impressive here for Pasta Polo. 33 true skill and some silver chevrons under there as well. Lovely, lovely stuff. Same rank as me, actually. True skill can be quite deceiving, though. One of the things is the uncertainty value, which was recently adjusted or tweaked, or everybody got a little bit less uncertain, so that I think people would kind of shift around a little bit, I think is the idea there. Uh, anyway, the uncertainty value, once it diminishes to a certain point, you basically don't move on the ladder unless you go absolutely buck wild on a match with people far, far greater than you as far as open skill values goes. It's a bit of an interesting system. Very strange. There's, what, eight now? I'm keeping track so that you don't have to. Sinks. Up to no good. We have a uh, construction tower building up here on the high ground. This screams to me the confidence of a man who wants to go for a gauntlet. Come on, I know we're going to put one down. Oh, we're going for Antier here. Okay. Are we setting up a forward base? Antier, very expensive, by the way. 750 metal, which is basically all of the economy of the Cyan Commander right here. I don't mind this on the front line, actually. The chainsaw is really, really nice as far as the Antier Tower goes. Basically keeps the airspace clear for three different lanes. I mean, kind of the air lane right here, and then you have the northern lane and the southern lane. I actually don't mind that at all. That's actually a pretty good move. It does mean, of course, though, that the blue commander here is going to be a little bit behind as far as getting units on the field goes. We do have a couple of them rolling out right now, but that anti-air tower is going to take up the vast majority of the current unit pool. Yeah, you know what? These Centurions are working out quite nicely. Well, except for when they get degunned. But other than that, they are working quite nicely. Yeah, they provide enough vision range for these Rocketeers to fire away, but they also provide a nice little bit of sturdiness, right? The HP buffer. That's exactly what you need when you're going for one of those slower compositions. Big Blitz pull, by the way. We'll jump on top of a whole bunch of the bots right here for the Yellow Commander. But that T2 transition should be well underway. Yeah, we've already got the T2 constructors out and working. We've got some T2 mechs already up and running. Well, T2 mech singular, I suppose. Already up and running. But you can see those T2 vehicles being handed out between all the players right here. Lovely, lovely stuff. Especially if you're going to be playing a more committed backline T2 role. Getting those T2 constructors out. And you can always ask for payment or take payment. But, uh typically get those out before you even consider the payment. Plan to get them out before you plan on getting paid for them. Sort of your way of repaying your teammates. Obviously a little bit of a different scenario in this case where we find ourselves with a frontliner and backliner playing as the same person. Tanks falling left and right here. Rocketeers and Maces held together right here by the Resbots. Love to see that from Amiu. Clocking in at 15 true skill, but showing us some excellent skill on the front lines. Yeah, patching up those units, beautifully done. Yeah, this is the this is the kind of resbot control that absolutely wins you these battles against vehicles. You just have to trade a couple times efficiently. It's just the first or first or second engagement. Just those first couple are the only ones that you really have to take efficiently. And then after that, you start to snowball so greatly. Whether you turn those units back into bots to continue the push, or if you just resurrect their tanks and fold those into your army as well. Whichever choice you decide to make. One way or another, your army is going to continue to grow semi-exponentially, essentially funded by the enemy's economy, and you're going to find yourself in a great position. That's exactly what the Green Commander is looking at right here. A stalwart defense for Adam Skull, who set up quite a lot of, yeah, uh, walls over here. The uh, Dragon's Teeth fortifications. We've got some flamethrower pop-up turrets as well. Wolverines here being such a pest. Yeah, the Jamming Tower making this very, very difficult right now for the Powder Blue Commander to deal with. We do have a uh, bunch of shuriken up and available right here from the Maroon Commander, Agressa, who has decided to go into a little bit of air technology, that good old-fashioned Cortex Brutalist Air. Very, very powerful. Wouldn't mind seeing a couple of bombers slip across the map, but again, it's actually going to be really difficult to fit those through because we have an air player right here, of course, in the back line, the uh, Lime Green Commander, but we also have these anti-air defenses set up over here. Ah, we did go for a gauntlet. I knew it. <laughs> One of the few positions where I think the gauntlet actually makes enough sense. You can see the range on this is actually tremendous. It's able to fire all the way over here to Catroll's army, basically denying all three of these metal extractors here, but it can also fire away at the red army over on this side as well. Yeah, 
one of the few gauntlets that I feel like definitely well worth its material value. Certainly has the potential to be, anyways. Couple of Mauser. Rolling out to the front lines eventually. Finally gonna get that T2 unit production under underway. Way slower than any T2 transitions right here from the blue team, though. Yeah, there we go. We do have one T2 lab. The uh, green commander deciding that there's enough units on the front and going for a T2 lab. When in doubt, you can always use those resbots to eat up your army to turn them into T2 units, and especially I'd love to see that now that we see the T2 Mauser absolutely devastating all of these units on the front. It only take three or four shots in order for those Mauser to completely obliterate this Rocketeer Mace army right here. For the Green Commander, I think it would be extremely wise to start consuming these units and using them to fund a proper T2 transition. Get that T2 economy up and running. Get those T2 units out. They're really the only way that you're going to stay in this game in a full face-to-face -face fight. Down they all go. One or two volleys, and those Mauser have completely eradicated all the res bots that were once here for the Green Commander. That was about a thousand and a half metal, completely down the drain right there. Definitely hurts. Lightning tank finding the perfect engagement right here. That's Whistlers and Shell Shockers. Pretty much a feast for that beautiful, beautiful Jaguar Lightning tank. There he goes. Gonna find a constructor over here as well. Can get the kill. It's a lot of damage. Ooh, it will not get the kill though. The Beamer turret will get the kill on the Jaguar right there. Very nicely done. As we send the horde forward. Mass Pawn to try and break this position. Not quite enough. They did some good damage, but not quite enough to completely break this. Gauntlet still shelling away up on the high ground here. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. The blue team, however, is going to start falling, around, falling behind quite quickly here if they don't get a T2 transition underway. Ah, the amount of gauntlets coming up is really concerning. That is so much metal being put on the front lines right here and not into tech or units. Very, very concerning. Interesting hovercraft play, by the way, up here on the, nor the northern side. New player. Maybe living up to the name, or maybe there's a strategy here that we're not quite appreciating well enough. It's the earliest rocket unit that you can get, not a uh, or missile unit. I, I don't, I can never remember the distinction. Somebody explains it to me every once in a while. It's about a couple of videos or so gap before somebody has to explain it again every single time. Um, but either way, the, the idea being it fires a big high arcing rocket. Very, very good against static defense or just anything else that isn't moving particularly fastly. Radar and Mauser go down right here. Jumped on by this T1 army. Surprising that T1 army was as effective against that T2 unit ball as it was. But I suppose Jaguars aren't necessarily the heaviest armored units in the books, and neither are the Mausers, certainly. Unicorn Cats has a tremendous opportunity right here. If we can eat up a lot of this, all these T2 units that are very expensive to field, if we can eat up just about all of these and manage to actually use them to fund a really, really quick T2 transition, I think the Blue Commander can stay in this game. But it's just a numbers game, and you can see already the red team is starting to pull ahead here by about uh, 40 metal or so. The red team has an advantage, only going to exacerbate itself more as we continue down this game. 680 metal for a pit bull, definitely going to be effective, very cost effective against this T1 army here. Once the T2 units start to come out, the pit bull becomes less and less effective. Still very effective, but less so. Against the T1 though, it will absolutely slaughter. Yeah, it's going to come up well in time to deflect this attack. Pretty much perfect, yeah. Right on time to blast away a whole bunch of these units. Beautifully done. Just like that, those Rocketeers are forced back by this T2 pop-up turret. Yeah, pop-up Gauss Cannon. It's its uh, technical name. That's its, that's its degree. We have the build power here. I'd love to see this gauntlet dismantled. I'm always a big fan of finding efficient ways to recycle your army into something a little bit better. Oftentimes we see that sort of thing talked about in the eco sector, but it's just as important to remember that you can do the same thing with your army units just as well. Recycling the units, the T1 units, into more efficient T2 units. Radar uh, vehicle will be resurrected here, only be, to be blasted to smithereens once again. All right. Resbots definitely having an uh, ambitious future here. This is nice, though. The resurrected Mauser are actually contributing a lot, firing away at some of these bulls that are pushing forward, but also doing a stupendous job at blasting away at a bunch of this T1. Rattlesnake up and running, though. Oh, that rattlesnake hurts. You can see the effective range of that is quite tremendous here. Without anything to counter that rattlesnake, sharpshooters, hounds, a whole bunch of welders, basically anything mass T2. Going to be very cost inefficient the longer we stay under the firing range here of that pop-up Gauss cannon. Pop-up plasma artillery, pardon me. Resbot set on a reclaim command here, trying to make the best of a fairly bad situation. Tick spam underway here from Pasta Pola as well. Pasta Pola 
obviously benefiting from that massive economic benefit of having multiple different economies all at the same time, but using that advantage well to their own by using those vehicles in combination with the bots here, using the advantage of the res bots in combination with the advantage of the vehicles. Lovely stuff. One of those things that's really hard to pull off all on your own, but sure, if you got double the economy, you just might as well. Big stall on the southern side here. Ah, we're pouring more and more units into this T T1 economy. I mean, you can imagine upgrading these T2 Maxes is great, but you can imagine we could swap all this out for one Rattlesnake, one Persecutor. Any of those T2 defenses is going to work miles better than any of the T1 stuff. We also don't have a fabulous economy back here. It's a bunch of wind turbines, and my goodness, that wind speed is plummeting. Oh, no. Wind speed dropping all the way to 0 0.5? Uh, 0.5 at its lowest right there. Just atrocious. Uh, sure, I can jump on top of some bulls here. Okay, not bad. Yep, 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 there we go. Shuriken pulled. We'll jump on top of all this. They've been, uh, they've given enough time right here to the Red Commander to get some light anti-air up. We'll shoo back the majority of those, but for the very least amount. Yeah, those hounds did manage to take down one of those bulls. Not the end of the world, but definitely not gonna feel great. T2 is finally handed out to the Blue Commander, but it feels like we're so far behind. Economically speaking, the red player has had, well, obviously a, more, a much more powerful economy right here, but on the front lines too, just having a way, way, way more well put together T2 economy, and I think we're seeing that advantage expressed right now. Big old medium tank run by, but the shurikens are already out. This is a misplay right here by the pink commander who saw those shurikens earlier and neglected them. Didn't include any anti-air here. Maybe relying a little too heavily on the air player who's not going to address this, address this, pardon me. It's a tricky situation. If you sacrifice all your fighters here to save this army how much value is it really going to get now that we're well into the t2 era i think the right call here isn't to pull the fighters and deal with this i think you have to accept the losses and move along here even though it burns to be that tank commander losing those tanks right there definitely should be the signal to black fangs that it is well in a way time to transition away from this t1 army twilight set up all over the place or paralyzing a whole bunch of these units is pretty funny they are effectively the emp landmine that i would love to see in practice, not exactly the same, but relatively similar. I wonder if that's been, I mean, I'm sure that's been discussed before, but I wonder what the, uh, I wonder if there's any admin thoughts on that already, or if it's already been considered. Resbot's eating up all this juicy, juicy T1 medium tank metal. Deposited directly onto the front lines right there for the green commander, meaning that this hound army is going to grow just a little bit wider. We're actually uh, overflowing metal right now, so definitely a good opportunity to go for some more economy. We do indeed see some advanced solar panels coming up. Hell, we almost have an entire metal's worth of fusion reactor. Wouldn't even mind seeing that be plopped down right there. Always a difficult decision to figure out when exactly is going to be the most efficient time to go for one of those fusion reactors. Essentially, the two schools of thought are as soon as you can and as soon as you have the metal. <laughs> kind of polar opposites in that way, I suppose. Oh, oh, chainsaw's firing away now. Not bad. Big fighter pull right here. Uh, I guess it's to stop this wave. Okay. We're trying to catch some hounds here as well. Ah, don't like it. Felt a little bit like we were just kind of throwing the fighters for no reason. Not a bad idea if you have a follow-up here or if you can use that fighter pull to divert fighters away and bomb something else. Maybe if we wanted to bomb this section, for instance. But I feel like those fighters essentially died needlessly. It also means that the air wall is completely clear right here for the Maroon Commander. Oh no, Shuriken moving in once more. This is a huge catch. How many metal, how much metal and bulls is this right here? 6,650 metal. May I remind you, it takes 9,000 metal to build an Aphis. So that's damn close to an entire Aphis's worth of metal paralyzed on the front lines. The only question I have is why aren't we jumping even harder? Yeah, continue continue the push right here. Send the shuriken to catch these bulls. If you catch these bulls and you reclaim all that, that is going to be the juiciest payday that I think we've seen all game right here. Oh, Fiend's coming around trying to do a little bit of damage here. I think they were checking to see if this commander had already been wrecked or had already been uh, eaten up the wreckage of it. Certainly has. Resbots have been hard at work making sure that all of this turns into new units for the front lines of the blue team. The red team making plays, but the blue team reacting to them almost perfectly here. <laughs> the amount of static defense over here is compelling. Twin ar twin uh, agitators over here. Almost said arbiters. Slightly different unit. Ooh, commander goes down over here, though. Yeah, it's one, one of the reasons why it's so important to remove the commander from the front as soon as you start to see those T2 units. You have to kind of pull it back and cloak it and make sure that it stays in a uh, 
a somewhat appropriate position. Do we have any tech to speak of here for the blue team? Doesn't look like it. We do have an Aphis underway right here for the maddest man. Or maybe the maddest man. Not sure exactly. Ooh, geothermal. Cerberus geothermal cannon. That three-headed blaster shooting away at the forces of Catrol, the orange commander. Suffering greatly from that plasma cannon's wrath. An absurdly powerful beast. Yeah, you can see even one of its shots capable of rickish or ravaging the uh, the holes right there of those T1 bases. My goodness. Those things are no fun to stand near. And up on top of that hill, it has tremendous range as well, making it a beast to go up against right here. Yeah, Catrol forced backwards right now. A lot of that snowball was just removed. That server is making this a very, very efficient fight right here. Only a couple of blasts to take down even some of the static defense. Those missile missile hovercraft over here doing a fabulous job. Another massive pull of the shurikens. My goodness, we can't keep getting away with this. This is absolute bloody murder. Oh, spy tank is discovered. That's a huge catch as well. Spy tank discovered immediately tells you that the enemy is thinking about sneaking into your backline. It's a really, really important ping right here that Fractal Hex is po pointing out to his teammates indicating that this uh, spy tank is out and available and everybody should be well aware of it. Obviously, spy tanks in the back line popping economies and detonating aphises. Not a good look. What another beautiful catch right here, though. Fractal Hex absolutely on top of it with the air pool, using those shurikens to devastating effect. One of those few units that really doesn't lose its effectiveness as you go through the game. Only really countered by mass AO uh, well, AOE AA. It's a complicated one, but you get what I mean. The uh, flak turrets, flak boats, flak bots. <laughs> flak, I guess, being the, the most important thing there. Overall, though, really, really nicely done. Commander has yet to be reclaimed right here. Do we have any constructors or anything? I don't see any. Ah, yeah, tank commander definitely falling behind here. Oh, we have a full-blown T2 lab. We just haven't... Haven't talked to the commander yet. I haven't sent anything forward to get to the commander yet. Got the uh, good old-fashioned T2 Cortex units. We're going to start up a missile truck here. Don't mind it. Missile truck's quite powerful. Do we have something going on on the back line here? Oh, I am not going to micro stuff that you give me. You need to micro it yourself and give things that are useful. All right. Unicorn cats laying down the law. <laughs> not sure why you wouldn't want to micro things that are handed over here. Especially if they were things that match the composition already. A bunch of tiger tanks or a bunch of things like that. But to each their own, I suppose. There we go. Persecutor firing away. Does manage to take down one of those metal extractors over here. Very good indeed. Artillery seems to be a prominent theme in this map. Yeah. Certainly the amount of pork we're seeing here is indicative of unconfident players. Not entirely sure what should be their next move right here. I am glad to see, though, that we have... Let me go and clear this, by the way. I am glad to see, though, that we do have plans to increase the technological level. My goodness, that's a lot of advanced solars as well. We have 9,000 metal worth of A solars. We could convert all of that into an APHIS here and produce twice as much energy. Impressive. Easy, easy way of highlighting the efficiency ratios there by just showing the same amount of metal but only producing about half as much energy. This is a tricky one. This is this is a really tricky position to be because of those walls here, but I think probably the best idea would be to go for a spam. Sending forward a big spam of units, probably not the worst idea because obviously they would drain all the shots right here from a whole bunch of this stuff. Ah, we do have a Juno missile. That's great as well. Taking down some of those radar jammers. Very inconvenient. Speaking of spams, we do have one breaking through the northern lane. We have a bunch of ticks, a bunch of seekers, a bunch of everything else moving through this northern side, even hover tanks. Okay. Hover tanks, questionable. The rocket hovers were a cheeky move, but the hover tanks definitely a bit more uh, strange. Yeah. As some marauders decide to move across the map. This is what the blue team has been afraid of. That red player with an uncontested double economy going to start sending a couple of these marauder across the map. Now, interestingly, one of the counters to the marauder, and I know it's, I sing its praises often, but it's because it's such a powerful unit, is the welder. Yeah, the Humble Welder actually capable of shutting down Marauder quite nicely. Obviously, you have to be in the right position at the right time in order to actually make that happen. But it's not the end of the world, and especially if you've already got T2 Labs up and running. Usually getting out a couple of Marauder is not especially difficult to do. Wasp Gum Ships up in the air trying to shut these down, but there's just not enough firepower here. And you can see about 2, maybe 3% damage per Wasp missile fired away right there. 
But that is going to be the majority of the blue base right there completely destroyed. Yeah, fusion reactor targeted down. Wind turbines will follow in the mass AOE explosion as those marauders get in the back. Well, you know what? Not as much damage as I actually thought. We will eventually clean this up with the gunships, I do believe. Or maybe not. That anti-air backpack missile is pretty impressive. <laughs> I love a good wind turbine chain reaction. Beautiful. Absolute. Oh my goodness. All right. We've got thermonuclear plans, unfortunately, to be interrupted by this uh, single marauder making it into the back line. <laughs> oh, please consume it. Yeah, not a, not a lot of great options here. Obviously, for uh, Cortex, it would be to make Tigers. We, we've got a lot of plans that are all lined up against each other here. We have the Advanced Solars taking up so much metal in the inventory right here of the Maddest Man. And then, of course, we have the Nuclear Launchers, which will be taking up a whole bunch of metal. And the Zars, which are probably the most metal-intensive thing of this all, while trying to go for Aphises right here. It's definitely a mixture, a big collage of ideas. And I think dedicating to one or the other or the other... Any of these individually would probably be a whole lot more powerful than all of them conjoined. I mean, obviously, if it all comes online, that's fabulous, but that'll be in about 50 minutes. And if this game goes that long, I'm going to need a much, much more refreshed drink. I'm going to pour myself half a Coke. Not going to carry me through a good old-fashioned two-hour late-game brawl. <laughs> as wonderful as those are to see, you can only commentate through so many of them. Tick spam. Achieving not very much here, actually. Do we have an EMP missile, or are these just good old-fashioned spy bots? No, we do have a paralyzer. Okay, lovely. Paralyzer are very underutilized, in my opinion. The problem with the paralyzer, of course, being that it's a high investment, it's a high tech level. You have to put a lot down on the field in order to get any value out of it at all. Similar, I guess I would say, to the gauntlet or the agitator, those those TU-1 uh, plasma artillery. Where they have to they have to be used very very specifically and under very specific circumstances to be worth all too much in the field. The uh, blue team definitely feels half committed to a lot of ideas, though. The red team has the benefit of their mainline back, back player, their tech player, being one player. <laughs> it's only one player controlling all that, which means that obviously you have the, the, the focus there, right? Whereas the blue team... Their, their, their ideas are kind of all over the place, like I pointed out already with the economy and the new production and all that good stuff. Sharpshooter's blasting way over here, by the way. Yeah, actually putting in some work against that Razorback. That's quite a nice pick right there. Shutting down that Razorback definitely removes a whole lot of the threat right here from these front lines. You have to be so careful about this, though. Here come the mate, or sorry, the uh, Zars moving forward with the Banishers. Long gone is the Age of Mace. I sure hope we have a couple of pinpointers in the back lines. I've been experimenting with them. It turns out when you're the tech player, building one or two pinpointers is actually extremely cheap. Relative to the benefit it grants the team, I believe it's extremely, extremely cheap. Almost always worth it. That server is firing away. Still getting value. I wonder what the kill count on that bad boy is. 27 kills and counting. Not bad whatsoever. This area continually paralyzed. So frustrating to deal with. At this point, do you consider moving the LRPC? Paralyzed for 30 seconds. My goodness, that's an eternity in bar. Another race back up on the field. The defensive line has crumbled, though. Sharpshooters wasting their shots on chaff that's being thrown forward here. Definitely not ideal. That Zara is on a sliver of health, and it will eventually go down, but it will be replaced immediately by a race back. We're finally setting up spams right here, but most of the units that those spams would accompany, those spams would enable, have already been dealt with. There's a couple of sharpshooters here and there. There's a couple of fat boys marching forward. A couple of units here and there, but it's it feels like we're just kind of all over the place, you know. One thing I'll say is that these early onset T3 units from the Red Commander have huge potential. Using those in the right place at the right time can definitely unlock a lot of opportunities for the Red Team. And it doesn't feel like they've quite managed to do that yet. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, there's a big, uh, <laughs> big forward production area up here on this mountainside. Not sure how we managed to smuggle all these bots up here, but they do set up a rattlesnake. It'll all be paralyzed by the paralysis missile, the, the paralyzer, as it's aptly named. Definitely a brutal thing to have up on the hillside firing away at you. Firing away at you though. Massive lightning tank pull. I was about to pull away, but I think we want to see this one. 
Nice D-guns right there. Killer D-guns right there from Catroll. Beautifully done by the Orange Commander. Manages to D-gun down basically all of those lightning tanks. Won't save that commander from the ongoing splash of all of the missiles, plasma, gunfire, and artillery barrage. But very, very nicely done, to say the very least. Shut down a whole bunch of those lightning tanks that were moving forward that would have absolutely swarmed through this area and crushed all of the defenses here. At the very least, buying the red team valuable seconds so that this bottom side can be caved in. Rotter have been resurrected here. Taking heavy fire, though, from this advanced exploiter. It's been set up on this hillside. Lovely, lovely stuff. Big sharpshooter ball moving forward. So careful not to lose all these. We need some welders in front of them to make sure that the rover spam doesn't eat up all their shots like it currently is. Ah. Yeah, those rovers are granting the vision that the artillery needs to fire away at these sharpshooters, meaning, of course, that they're not going to be nearly as effective. I mean, they'll be effective, but they're also extremely squishy, and losing them before they're able to really get a tremendous amount of value out, it costs quite a lot. This is much better. We do have the tick spam accompanying these sharpshooters, so this exploiter will eventually fall. Nicely done right there. Northern side is an absolute shambles, though. The humblest of units, the mighty tick, will blast down the Aphis over on this top side. It was aggressive. It's been handed over now to Achille, who is uh, going to suffer the thermonuclear wrath of the tick as it ravages that backline economy. Razorbacks are sent up north, and those will eventually clean up a lot of those little chaff units. But I can't help but wonder if too much damage has already been done. The red team with that huge economic advantage just hasn't been able to capitalize on it over the last couple of minutes. Despite what looked like a more lackluster design from the blue team, it turns out it doesn't matter how lackluster you are, you are as long as you've got some push going on. And certainly the aggression over the last couple of minutes has been way higher for the blue team. Things could change, though, as these Razorbacks are moved around the map here. Would love to see these handed out here, maybe to the yellow commander, who's essentially single-handedly holding this northern side. We also have a couple dragons up in the air. Always powerful, of course, as a way of clearing out areas that are unprotected by an unceremoniously gigantosaurus amount of anti-air, i.e. about 20 or 30 T2 anti-air fighters. Pretty much what you need to take down a dragon in a reasonable amount of time. Light anti-air plinking off the heavy armor plating right here. Flag turret doing a little bit better, but not by a whole tremendous margin. What does do to one of these? Yeah, it's about like 2%, 1 to 2% of damage per shot. Horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. <laughs> Absolutely not efficient. Oh, sharpshooters. Oh, no, taking so much damage. Finally, the welders get up front to take the brunt of that damage. But my goodness, what a brutal, brutal showing. A terrible, terrible day for those poor sharpshooters in the back that were firing away at all the poor, unmarked chaff running forward never received a name for its duty was to die. Razorback stabilized the northern section. Going to allow Achilles to potentially resurrect, potentially, said that with my southern drawl, potentially resurrect this uh, advanced fusion reactor over here that once belonged to the Maroon Commander. Wouldn't be the worst idea to get that back up and running, obviously. Significantly it contributes to the economy here. This czar needs to die. Oh my goodness, how many kills does this czar have? 19 kills, and a whole lot of those have been sharpshooters here. Extremely, extremely valuable heavy tank. I love to see it. The czar, one of those units that's very satisfying to watch. Ah, the fighters are pulled against the dragons. It's an excellent pull. A lot of T1 in the mix, though. There we go. The T2 fighters finally jump on top of all this. There's a light anti-air gun attached on the dragon, so you have to be really careful about sending in one fighter at a time. If you just stream in singular fighters, the dragons will actually win. So there's a weird, there's a weird snowballish number where the dragons are actually able to be their own anti-air, which is quite horrifying. Unkillable T2, essentially T3 air units flying towards your base. Your only hope, T2 fighters. And there's enough of them to actually shoot down the T2 fighters without even the need of an air wall. Pretty terrifying. Counter counterpoint to that though, playing devil's advocate, I would say if you have enough metal to uh, produce that many dragons. You're definitely in a pretty good spot regardless. Now, one thing that's always an option is actually to degun them. Doesn't seem like it, but yeah, any any unit in bar can be degunned if you target it, and you can fire your degun up into the air and hit those gunships. One of the few units where I feel like it's really uh, reasonably plausible that you might, you know, conceivably hit it with its uh, with your degun, as far as air units go anyways. Certainly an option to keep in mind, though, because in a worst-case worst scenario, it's better to have that option in your pocket than to 
not know about it, not utilize it. Fat boy swinging its head back and forth, trying to find a good target. More likely to friendly fire than anything else. Definitely not the frontliner unit I would have gone for. You know the one I would have reached for. It's the welder, of course. Archangel anti-air bots might actually be a decent counter to the dragon, just because they fire so many bursts of anti-air. They fire so many projectiles. Kind of more what you're looking for, just because typically you have to bring down the dragon with superior numbers. T3 units rolling out of the lab, by the way, from Unicorn Cats, who's decided to transition into a full-blown T3 gantry. We have some Shiva rolling out here. Wouldn't mind seeing a demon or two pumped out as well, just to aid the front line and maybe break these Razorbacks that have been set up as a defensive perimeter over here on the top-hand side. Red player actually decides to resurrect this Aphis. Don't mind it one bit. Sending that Aphis, or setting that Aphis, pardon me, back up and online. Definitely going to be crucial to getting the economy well bolstered here. We do have a fabulous economy coming up and online, by the way. We have uh, T2 Constructor building some of those Cortex T2 energy exchangers. And then, of course, ooh, nice pop right there. And then, of course, we have the uh, Aphis is coming online as well. Yeah, the Tick Stream running right on past this base over here. Two or three LLTs shuts all this down. I want to be clear. It's uh, it's not a tremendous commitment that it takes in order to shuttle that down. Ooh, fighter, fighters jump on top of the dragons again. 5,000 metal a dragon going down right here. A lot of T1, though. Ah, you know what? It's a lot of T1. Man, if there wasn't so many T1 fighters here, if this was all T2, I think this probably would have been six or seven dead dragons. And uh, despite no air pull from the yellow commander here, I think a lot of those dragons are actually going to walk out of this relatively unarmed. Yeah. The era of the T1 fighter is definitely over. It's about time we switch this lab off, transition it into a T2 lab, and just start spamming T2 fighters out of both labs here. Not worth even the build power or the time it takes to build those T1 fighters, when instead you can invest in even a smaller number of T2 fighters. The math just isn't there. I think they do almost four times as much damage, and I believe they do uh, have about twice as much health. So the, the math supports going T2 figs essentially as soon as you can. I wonder what their cost is, actually. I've never thought about this before. You don't have a lot of options. 135 metal per fighter here. It's actually uh, pretty impressive when you think about the amount of fighters that you lose in a game. But anyway, versus 73. Yeah, so a little, a little bit less than double the cost for significantly higher stats. Whoa, massive thermonuclear explosion takes out this entire front line. Luckily, there's some Razorbacks in place right here from Pasta Polo, who's absolutely on top of them across the map here. What we're seeing right now is absolutely the efficiency of T3 holding back what otherwise would be a tremendous advantage. Yeah. Those T3 units have been extremely, extremely cost-effective. And that's what the blue team is forced to deal with now. Black Truck's trying desperately to shoot down all these gunships. Not a chance. Those gunships are too powerful. For some reason, they're shooting at the blank space in and around the area, but it looks like eventually they'll figure themselves out. Big uh, air repair pad set up over here. Interesting. I guess it's worth it if you're going to go into gunships. There's a good odds that your gunships make it out of there. The time is nigh, though. This is the unstoppable push of the Armada faction. Thor plus Pencil Neck. Relatively unstoppable, plus the tick spam, and you're looking at a real good situation here. Technically possible to stop a Thor with sharpshooters. You need about 20 of them, though. Not very efficient as far as metal production value goes. Well, maybe. Eh, 680 metal versus 9,000. No, definitely not efficient. Fractal Hex in position, though. This is the importance of those spams and having a really, really, really thorough spam, a really powerful spam to make sure that that doesn't happen. Gets absolutely degunned to oblivion right here, that first Thor out on the field. Ah, it's older cousin. Coming in to replace it, though. Where was it? I saw it on the minimap. There he is. Stop. 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 I love that little sound effect. The Juggernauts is especially menacing as well. The Titan is a good one. The uh, Red Commander, Pasta Polo, definitely with a stranglehold on the T3 technological prowess. Owns all of the uh, intellectual property rights for all the T3, I suppose. EMP missiles have already been utilized right here, so this Thor... I actually just got one back. Now, I wouldn't mind seeing a lot of these Shiva EMP'd right here. Obviously makes them quite a bit less effective. Not that it matters. My goodness, the Razorbacks having an absolute field day, tearing apart all of that blue T3. Man, Shivas have never looked worse, have they? 
Our motto supremacy for life. Well, this is about as good as it gets, though. Shiva firing into a big clustered up group of Razorbacks. Probably just about as efficient at this point now that it's firing into a big clumped up group, yeah. The uh, AoE effect now doing tons and tons of damage right there. I think that single Shiva was probably more efficient than all the other ones combined. Yeah, yeah, here come those dragons. Very difficult to stop. We do finally have enough T2 fighters to shut these down, but already they burn away the entire base right here of the Powder Blue Commander Locascio on the southern side. My goodness, do those dragons do work. Blasting away that base. Definitely a tiebreaker if ever there was one. There's just not enough fighters to shoot it down. Send 10, send 100, send a million. It will not matter. That dragon just keeps on spitting fire. Luckily for the Green Commander, didn't result in the thermonuclear detonation of the base. Just barely the Aphis comes online, by the way. Always so tragic when an Aphis comes online just in time for it to be exploded. Does, you know, uncountably many more damage than otherwise would have. Three nukes up in the air. Three anti-nukes. Exactly the same spot. Trying to overwhelm the enemy's anti-nuke systems using Cortex nuclear weapons. Definitely a uh, pricey strategy. Gonna cost you a whole lot more than it'll cost the enemy to shut down. One of the reasons why we don't see it all too often. The other, of course, being that it leaves your front line, or your, well, yeah, your front line teammates. There's no way you're getting away with it on the front line, so you're definitely playing back line. Uh, leaves them without much hope of support. Yeah, you're, you're not really gonna be able to accomplish all too much as long as the enemy keeps even a single anti-nuke truck anywhere near the front lines. Titans being very cautious right here, as well they should be. Unicorn Cat's commander is prowling around right here. Does the Titan spy it? No, not quite. Yeah, no clue about that commander lying in the murk right here. Oh, there he goes. Uh -oh, oh. There we go. Beautiful D gun right there. I can't help but wonder if there's an effective strategy that revolves around making four or five spy bots and then detonating them to paralyze the Titan before trying to capture it. I really do wonder if that would be effective. Wait, are those... <laughs> well, all right. That's one way to shut down the enemy anti-air. Uh, or the air, enemy fighter, rather. Just park your AA trucks directly underneath their fighter wall. Certainly quite effective. Uh, another Titan D-Gun down, by the way. Unicorn Cat's looking extremely efficient. As far as the commander goes, anyways. This uh, looks absurdly pushable. Two or three T2 units sent directly through this pathway right here absolutely detonate this base. I guess to be fair though, these shield bubbles would put up a little bit of a fight, but if they were sumos or essentially anything with a laser component, definitely find yourself in a tricky situation here. Now the red team reclaiming the advantage by about a hundred. Metal per second, that is. Although vastly more when we go on a big reclaim bender like this. Look at how many res bots we're sending forward. I absolutely love this. This is the kind of play that gets you back into a game. Or rather, the kind of play that keeps you in the game. It's a losing one. <laughs> We're going for more nukes over here. How precious. I'm always a little bit appalled when I see that many nukes. The amount of resources it takes in order to produce a nuke, roughly a thousand energy per second. You can do the conversion, but I'll tell you right now, that's about... I want to say about 16 metal per second. More or less. Depends on the converter that you use. Trying to, trying to do the mental math in my head to see if that's true. I'm pretty sure it is. Don't quote me on it just in case, but I'm pretty sure it's about accurate. Anywhere anywhere from 10 to 60 metal per second, something like that. Oh, look at that. We're even eating up the Aphis right here. Yeah, the red team completely full on metal because they've been eating everything. To be fair, though, the blue team actually completely full on metal as well, but more so just because they can't spend it. Dra <laughs> Dragon's coming in to pop a whole bunch of the build power. No fighters in the wave right now because they were all shot down by those good old-fashioned anti-air trucks. Boom, go the Aphises for the Purple Commanders. And if there ever was a hero of this game, absolutely has got to be the Dragon for completely shutting down one, two, three bases, I think? Three or almost, maybe four bases, more or less, with the collateral damage, plus the collateral, collateral damage. Probably closer to four bases. The uh, flak trucks underneath the air wall absolutely thinning out the airline enough that those Dragons can just wander their way on in. They don't move fast, but they move fast enough. There's another one over here. Typically best practice is to build a couple of those air repair pads. One of the few units that can actually tremendously benefit from the air repair pad, the Dragon. What a fabulous economy in the back line right here from the Red Commander. 
Not slowing down, not stalling out on resources, continuing to spam out units, sending these tick spams forward to account for the Titans moving around, also getting the res bots though in case we need to pick any of them up. An excellent lesson in not stalling your own economy, not stopping when you get a little bit further ahead, continuing to press the advantage. Thor over here having a field day as these black trucks do actually shoot down a lot of the fighters right now for the yellow commander. If the green commander were a little bit more aggressive, oh, we have dragons fighting dragons, wonderful. <laughs> If the green commander were a little more aggressive with those dragons, I think actually we could probably snag a couple of kills over here. Unfortunately, those dragons are going to be used for base defense against dragons. Not going to work out all too well here. Fighter is certainly going to perform a little bit better. I mean, I suppose it does technically work. It's kind of the weirdest thing at all. Yeah, you know what? I mean, that's that's probably what blows my mind the most is that the dragons did actually semi-effectively counter all that. Fractal Hex has an incredibly important role to play exactly at this moment. If these dragons don't go and kill all this T3, go do a bunch of damage across the map, essentially equalize the battlefield right now, then the blue team is definitely done for good. Titans moving in over here. Do we still have our commander? We absolutely do. The, man, the maddest man sitting next to his 9,000 metal worth of advanced solar panels over here. Watching completely within reason to uh, move that commander over and degun some of these, by the way. Like, what is happening here, Scoob? Sorry, I read that, I read that in a, uh... I read that in a Scooby-Doo voice, or a Shaggy voice, pardon me. <laughs> like, zoinks! That's five nuclear chambers, Scoob! <laughs> Titans in the back line. We'll have a wonderful time detonating this beautiful, beautiful economy. Boom goes the base of the Lavender Commander. Further cementing the economic advantage that the red team has over the blue. At this point, the blue team begins to yield. And despite only four players remaining on the red team in total, despite being down a player from the get-go, despite, against all odds, managing to claw back from the brink of annihilation, it will be the blue team that claws defeat from the jaws of victory here in this game of beyond all reason. They know it. The red team knows it. They call GG. They submit. And the red team takes the win. What a beautiful, beautiful comeback. They had a tremendous advantage in the early game, but I was really worried for them with that northern side collapsing, but it was held spectacularly with those early T3 units. They were very efficient, making all the right moves at all the right places, continuing to scale the economies, and I think it was just another classic example of not running away with the advantage when you have it. Sure hope you enjoyed this game. I know I sure did. Feel free to leave a like down below if you did. Uh, you can also leave a dislike, I suppose, if you didn't enjoy the video, but I suppose I'm probably talking to the, you know, 1% or so that made it to the end of the video, so I'm probably, you know, picking my audience very carefully here. <laughs> Anywho, I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason, whether it's a live stream or whether it's a cast, and I uh, sure hope you have a great rest of your evening or your day, whenever you're starting off with. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out, everybody.